Hey everyone, I'm Jacob Straczynski, staff engineer at Planet Labs, and I'm here to talk about our observability journey from a suite of disparate tools to largely centralizing on Grafana Cloud and their platform. I'll be discussing our motivations for migrating, our vendor evaluation process, technical and project management strategies, as well as what we're looking forward to in the future. Forgot this guy. If you're not familiar with Planet Labs, we're an Earth observation company with a constellation of satellites capable of imaging the entire surface of our planet every single day. We have both medium and high resolution satellites capable of imaging large vehicles, but not people. We like to emphasize that because of privacy concerns. And I'll tell you, the physics makes it impossible with the satellites that we have, the size of them, to do that. Oop. In the media, you may have seen our images in various news organizations surrounding events like the war in Ukraine or the Nepal earthquake of 2015. Our imagery is used by companies around the world for analysis ranging from monitoring port activity for economic markers, identifying illegal mining and deforestation, and agricultural monitoring. So what was my role in this whole process? So I was closely and still am associated with the platform operations team at the time. In fact, I was the tech lead. Um, I was responsible for a lot of the design, implementation, plumbing, and configuration of the underlying systems. And I was heavily involved in the migration planning in conjunction with my technical program manager and engineering manager. A little bit of size and scale about our organization to help provide some context. So we produced about 45 million time series uh, before the migration produce about 110 terabytes of log data per month. We've got a dozen Kubernetes clusters, plus or minus a few if we had to stand one up. And we run about <clears throat> 100,000 instances at, uh, at peak. A little bit more detail. Um, with respect to the metrics, that number might be somewhat shocking for folks or maybe somewhat pedestrian for others. Um, but you know, you've got your C advisor and KubeState metrics data that sort of comes along with all of your Kubernetes pods. And then with the 100,000 instances, I think it's interesting to note that we peak at about 10,000 in our Kubernetes environment, and we have a separate uh, batch processing system, affectionately known as the job system, where we peak at about 90,000. And importantly, um, the organizational scale as well. Um, this is another kind of like dimension in the whole migration. We've got around 200 engineers, 24 teams, 120 GCP projects, and you know, for a Google Cloud customer, and 50 plus-ish microservices. All right, so let's set the stage around 2022 when this kind of idea of like, we gotta go and migrate to something better than our status quo. There's broad community and Planet Labs adoption of Prometheus, so this is really nice. There's broad community and Planet Labs adoption of Kubernetes. So this is going to be an important leverage point for us when it comes to migrating. Grafana is in use internally for our Kubernetes system. So we've got our internal Grafanas. They're deployed adjacent to each Kubernetes cluster. There's limited adoption of tracing within Planet Labs. And then there are other observability and IRM tools like Sentry and PagerDuty in use at the company. Um, so this is like a really simplified diagram of our uh, topology at the time. We're using Google Cloud monitoring. You know, just as a Google Cloud customer, you, you get this data. We're using Google Cloud logging for logs. I mentioned our internal Prometheuses. And we're using StatsD for quite a few older services that were deployed at the you know, early onset of our company. Um, and those are typically running through some kind of collect the telegraph agent um, before forwarding them to Splunk Observability, where we visualize them. And then, of course, we send uh, alerts to PagerDuty, which you know, hits me on my cell phone at 2 a.m., unfortunately. So that, that looks great, um, except we, gotta, we have a few kinks in this whole puzzle here. Uh, first of all, um, between Google Cloud logging and Splunk Observability, 
we don't really have this connection established. So if you need to go and look at your log data, um, because you're seeing a 500 error spike in one of your dashboards, you have to go and jump into Google Cloud Logging, get that time window aligned just right, reformatting timestamps, and oftentimes by then you might have just lost your, your context entirely. We have our internal Prometheus metrics, um, but we're sending a limited subset to Splunk at the time, or signal effects. Um, and they're highly aggregated. So if you really need to kind of drill down, um, you find yourself jumping into the localized Grafana instance as well. So um, that kind of brings us to this decision point. We can continue to expand our commit with Splunk. Maybe we should go and adopt Grafana. We're, we're using it internally, so we have some experience with it. And maybe we could uh, self-host. This is the self-hosting guy right here. <laughs> um, all this also kind of brings me to this uh, term of art in our industry of like, what's a single pane of glass? We've heard that term quite a bit. Well, I'll, I've kind of described what it isn't, right? We've got logs in Google Cloud logging, and you have to make that expensive context switch. We have metrics in both Splunk and Grafana. And tracing, well, what's that? We're not really using it. So we set about um, improving the status quo. And yeah, um, I'm here talking to you all today, so we clearly decided to buy instead of build, and we're using Grafana. Um, so this is straight from one of our product requirement documents as we um, kind of engage in this process. The central goal, right at the top of the doc, wanted to consolidate the three pillars into a single cohesive user experience. Logs, metrics, and traces should be provided in a single view and minimize context switching. And that kind of brought us to um, an evaluation process. So there was a period where uh, we started to dual publish uh, metrics and logs to both Splunk and Grafana. Um, importantly, we just fanned out the data to multiple vendors uh, under evaluation contracts. Um, we took advantage of high leverage integration points, so we had uniformly de 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 deployed remote write configurations and Google Cloud logging sync configurations. So this made it fairly straightforward to you know, basically fan out metrics to both the providers. Um, once we were doing that, we wanted to support some internal teams with adoption. Uh, so first, we identified teams with eager engineers that will act as early adopters and champions. Now, importantly, the relationships established in this phase remain strong into the migration process. So this is like a really great um, just migration strategy to use, leverage those early adopters. Once those teams had kind of gone and kicked tires uh, with the two products, um, we conducted user interviews. Um, so basically an exit interview after having used the product. Uh, important note here, you want to be systematic in how you gather your feedback so that you can quantify it. Um, I've linked to a SurveyMonkey article. It's like, you know, pretty pretty um, basic, but like the advice there um, is like awesome. And then of course uh, we funneled those results uh, into the vendor selection documentation. So we wanted to you know basically ratify our decision. Um, and the process we tend to use for uh, some of these things is an architectural decision record. Again, I've got a hyperlink there. Um, I've kind of characterized it as a concise alternative to RFCs or maybe more like full-fledged design docs. Um, one of the things I like about ADRs is, you know, any kind of instance where somebody might want to retrace your steps and in 2028 be like, why are you guys using Grafano? Honeycomb is out there. It's the new hotness. Well, you get a lot of air coverage. Just point them at the ADR and, you know, continue going on your business. So let's talk about why we chose Grafana in the end. And again, this was uh, feedback from actually one of our uh, documents. So there's seamless and responsive uh, a front end for combined log metric and tracing views, which reduced friction during troubleshooting and performance monitoring. The ability to leverage logs for ad hoc metrics with a progression to recording rules for longer time scales. So it's just really nice that you can start with a log QL query that you haven't yet converted into a time series necessarily, experiment with it, validate it, and then if you find you want to evaluate it over like a six-month time span in the future, you can 
progress it to a recording rule and get that metric time series that's a lot more efficient. The use of standard query languages reduce the barrier to entry as we grow the software organization. So, and I feel a little bit validated in, in this one in particular. Um, like Google recently deprecated their MQL query language and is kind of converging on PromQL as well. Um, you know, like superficially maybe like TraceQL and LogQL are similar to PromQL, but um, you know, it still helps to kind of dive into the syntax because it's not a completely different um, syntax when you do that. And we found like really positive results from active collaboration with um, Grafana's product teams and, and key engineers. So I don't want to oversell this. I don't know if everybody else is going to have this support experience based on your spend commit. Um, but talking to the actual contributors of the open source product while you're having issues with their cloud offering, having them tune it, having them kind of give us advice so we could meet each other halfway uh, was, was really important. Um, we found a lot of value there. And then, and also alluded to this briefly, but the commitment to the open source and big tent mindset for their community. And again, open source software, you can really feel that and the whole, you know, you know, with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. You know, it's nice to be able to source dive periodically. Cool, um, so we're now onto the migration. We've made the decision. We've got 24 teams to migrate some with half a dozen services and others with dozens of dashboards and just total alerts. Kind of brings me to the importance of, of change planning and kind of the thing that you're trying to manage is, well, basically your innovators and your early adopters during any migration are gonna be easy. They're just gonna almost wanna hop in once you offer the product in some kind of early access capacity. So the late majority and the, and the laggards that this process is really helpful with and, no judgment, as engineers, I think we all have competing priorities and some folks are gonna be more excited about observability than, than others within a big organization. Um, I've kind of characterized this as the goal um, being a smoothly orchestrated migration through a process that surfaces unknown unknowns, builds momentum with early adopters, provides sufficient resources for the thornier cases, i.e. the laggards, while providing coverage for the migration in the form of business justification and then frequent internal communications. And another thing you're kind of trying to avoid is an obligatory XKCD comic, although I think this is the first one I've seen today. You don't want to introduce Grafana Cloud, for example, and still have um, Splunk and, and Datadog somewhere in the, in the guts of your infra. All right, so a little bit on migration scoping. Roughly two dozen teams within the organization to migrate, mention that. There's a variety of shapes of workloads that publish metrics, so web services, probably the most familiar to many of us, but we've got scheduled tasks and batch processing workloads as well that tend to be instrumented. We're a polyglot org with lots of Python and Golang, so in our case that means, you know, sometimes you have to write wrappers and client libraries twice. And teams are already su subscribed to operational and non-operational work. I guess like, you know, again, you really want to give people a little bit more time than you think they're going to need or that you would need. So the early adopters, they might do it in a sprint or two, but realistically for a project like this, for a big organization, six months gives you a lot of headroom. So a little bit on project management and communication strategies that we used. Over communicate, I think this is probably the, the, the best lesson you can learn about just like communication uh, within a software company, over communicate kind of want to cast a wide net and meet people where they're at um, or where they happen to be at a point in time. So Slack, email, and Zoom. A little bit more on that. Um, so early on in the process, uh, we conducted interviews. And these stakeholder interviews were conducted with a shared rubric. That shared rubric ensures repeatability and fidelity in the process. So I wasn't the only one um, you know, running these interviews. Uh, we had a team, uh, I had a team behind me. Um, and it was you know, really good that we could collaborate on this rubric and make sure that we're offering a similar level of support, asking similar questions. And as a Google Doc, we could collaborate on it and, and refine it. Um, and the data in that Google document that we created during the interview process fed into the ticket creation that followed. Um, and I'll have a few screenshots of the Google Doc that we used. Um, we also offered office hours, so this is sort of a manifestation of the Zoom uh, communication style. And that was an opportunity to build community and talk shop, which is really fun. 
Um, and also, it gives engineers permission to utilize your time. Um, some folks are shy when they see my calendar with its Swiss cheese of meetings just scattered throughout. Um, so having that time set aside is it's really, really helpful. And then bi-monthly Slack updates. So broadcast to those that use Slack as their uh, productivity IDE instead of email. And here's an example of uh, the interview, uh, interview rubric that uh, basically created for the process. So just a few bits of like data entry. Um, we've got clear meeting goals uh, outlined here. This is really important, um, I think, you know, just within the document, but also within your, your calendar invites. I feel guilty <laughs> inviting people to a meeting. And when we're doing this across two dozen teams, you want to kind of let people know, why are you talking to me and occupying 90 minutes of my time? Um, and then within the document, we sort of like bootstrap people's migration process with like some inline tips, uh, links for more in-depth content. I've kind of included a lot of the like content in this like little image that we actually had in a more normative document that was part of our uh, internal knowledge base. And you kind of see here, um, after kind of going through the interview, you'd fill out these rows and kind of take an inventory of your various dashboards and so on. And this is important in the sort of uh, uncovering the unknown unknowns aspect. Like there were a lot of just interesting use cases I discovered, um, like systems that published maybe a few data points per day that would otherwise get TTL'd um, by some of our uh, like um, metrics aggregators. So their data would just disappear before it had a chance to, to increment. Um, and of course, after <laughs> everybody's showing cool demos, and I've just got a, a picture of some Jira tickets, <laughs> but after going through uh, that interview process, like producing this list of epics, it was really easy. We just kind of ran a CSV import on some of the data. A little bit on technical strategies as well. Um, and I alluded to this uh, briefly, but you want to minimize point to point integration. So use high leverage points. Uh, in our case, as a Google Cloud customer, we're using uh, cloud logging syncs and fleet-wide remote write configurations. Um, so we deploy all of our Prometheuses using GitOps. Makes it easy to go and update the configuration um, and just deploy it fleet-wide. Uh, logging syncs, if you're a Google Cloud user, you can set those on an organizational project or folder level. Uh, infrastructure as code, where applicable. Um, this maybe is more accurately termed configuration as code. Um, but specifically, uh, with Teams, folders, and contact points, and the notification policy as well, we wanted to make this repeatable when we were onboarding Teams. Um, so we've just got a data-driven YAML file. Uh, we add a team there. It splats out their, their team, their folders. It does the LDAP sync for us and sets up some contact points for them so that they can get paged. Yay. Um, with notification policies, uh, these, I think, can be a little bit brittle. So we wanted to offer some guardrails. By brittle, I mean you don't want to basically leave it wide open and let one configuration shadow the entire notification policy and consume all the alerts. Um, and then with alerts, we've decided as an organization to implement this as configuration or IEC as code, depending on your diction. Um, and that offers provenance for alert configuration and reconfiguration in, in our case. So why did we change this from high to low? Are we sweeping it under a rug? Or is there some kind of, uh, is it just a noisy alert or what have you? And then internal libraries, uh, these were quite useful for us as well. So we created a few um, opinionated thin wrappers um, and these facilitated an improved DevX in, in our case. And now, mind you, I think a lot of what we saw earlier today um, might kind of uh, succeed some of these, uh, this approach. Um, and the migra migration was an opportunity uh, to drive the adoption of these libraries as well. So if you were using Prometheus before, uh, you might as well adopt like your Prometheus client, but use kind of our thin wrapper around it if you're going to do the work anyway. Um, and we offered some compatibility layers. So examples of this, if you're a Stats D user, you know, you've got Stats D exporter, there's Vector, Telegraph, and probably Grafana agent as well, but for whatever reason, we didn't use it for, for Stats D specifically. Um, and here's an example of a shared service uh, dashboard uh, that we created that was, you know, powered by the fact that we had consistency around the service name attribute, uh, thanks to the client library that we were using. A little bit on the migration pains that we faced. Um, performance issues with Mimir and Loki, uh, except these were resolved by Grafana through collaboration and tuning. So a little bit of validation of the whole um, buy decision instead of build. Um, they were really quick, and I couldn't imagine having to go through this myself and with my team. 
Um, the Terraform provider uh, infrastructure's code exposes some of the impotence mismatches between the underlying APIs. So Grafana really is a, you know, an aggregation of a variety of products, and you can see a little bit of that when you use the IEC to configure things. Um, so like Loki versus Mimir recording rules require different tooling. Um, and then Grafana.com's organizational authorization rules versus the like, stack-specific Grafana.net authorization, you kind of see how that's different as well. Um, with cost management, um, we ran into a few um, kind of like issues as well. So the infra, um, we couldn't minimize it as much as we had anticipated. Like ideally, we're not running Prometheus servers or agents at all, but you still have to forward metrics. Um, and because of running things in agent mode um, and updating our Prometheus servers, that yielded about a half to a quarter reduction in resource utilization. It didn't get us down you know, to maybe like a 90% reduction. Um, cardinality often crops up with corrective action taken on our part. So um, if folks around for Omar's talk, he mentioned bringing their uh, time series from like 70 million to around 50, and we crept up to 60 million and were able to get it back down to 45 million using adaptive metrics, and nobody complained after I applied those rules. So awesome experience there. Um, and then the whole, like we were kind of maybe in this awkward transition where Grafana agent was going, and then they added Grafana agent flow mode, and then they just switched uh, Grafana agent flow to, to Alloy. Um, so that required a little bit of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know that. Um, it's not as bad as signal effects. They had like a dozen agents, it seemed. So like this is still better. And it looks like we're largely centralizing on Alloy at this point. And they offered, uh, you know, like a um, CLI command to go import your configuration, which I think worked quite well for us. Migration successes. Um, and this is just a quote from one of our engineers. I, I didn't ask him for permission to quote his name, so I'll just leave it anonymous for now. But Grafana Cloud significantly improved my team's ability to observe and triage the systems we own. We've been able to greatly decrease fragmentation in observability tooling and achieve consistency in how we monitor on alerts and key signals across our systems. Being able to easily triage issues across metrics, logs, and traces has helped us improve system performance as well as operator confidence when on call. Sounds like we met that goal at the outset. It also helped us, uh, it also equipped us to quickly sketch out dashboards or queries which answer product questions, leading to better understanding of not only how our systems perform, but how our users are interacting with them. Um, and what's next for us? So uh, K6, uh, we're looking into that. I, I'd been a K6 user prior to their um, sort of uh, adoption by Grafana. A strong combination of load and acceptance testing capabilities uh, makes it pretty useful. We're using the fledgling K6 operator as well, which makes it easy to scale um, basically your load generation beyond what you can do within a single instance. So um, if you've ever kind of done this in a large systems, uh, you'll kind of exhaust what like a single Kubernetes pod can do. You have to go and uh, repeat that to a few more replicas. Um, Pyroscope, with tracing, we're starting to do a lot of that. But if you're a Python user and you're kind of like, I'm just going to monkey patch every function call and like add tracing to it, don't do that. You're probably looking for profiling instead. Um, with Grafana Incident and Grafana OnCall, um, we need to still wean ourselves off of PagerDuty. Um, so if we do that, uh, if we move to Grafana Incident and OnCall, we'll have tighter integration to boot as well. This just hasn't been this big of an issue because the you know, call and engineer and page them functionality has largely worked for us. Um, and Grafana SLO has shown promise as a forcing function for interdependent teams to agree on contracts between their services. I think like informally, we've sort of been doing Grafana SLO before they introduced it by like creating alerts with you know, appropriate labels and then linking panels together. But if you do it with Grafana SLO, you kind of have a nice turnkey experience. Cool, um, I, that's my talk. Um, and thanks everybody uh, for, for attending. This is my GitHub if folks want to like kind of check out my profile. You'll see this picture, um, and I get a lot of comments on it. I'm like up here in Yosemite on the northeast buttress of Higher Cathedral at that point in time. Um, awesome.